Good day, everyone. A very warm welcome to this webinar titled Storytelling and Design for Emotions. This session is presented by the Design Singapore Council in partnership with Cadenze, a platform for creative learning online, and the Maryland Institute College of Art. The session is also supported by the National Design Centre and is part of the Centre's Emotive Design Programme lineup for the month of March 2021. Today's webinar consists of mainly two portions. We will be starting off with a sharing session by our speaker before ending with a Q&A segment moderated by Narelle Yabuka from DSG, where you will be able to ask questions and have an interactive time with us. In the spotlight today, we have Ms. Ellen Lupton, Ellen is a graduate faculty at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, where she has authored numerous books on design processes. She also serves as the Senior Curator of Contemporary Design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. Without further ado, I will now pass the time over to Ellen, who will be taking you through today's session. Ellen, please. Hello, it's so great to see you all. It's wonderful to be in Singapore tonight. I'm really excited to um, talk to you about storytelling and emotions. The content that I'm gonna share comes from these two books that were published by Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum, but they also come from my teaching at MICA. And you can see me here on the stage with my wonderful colleague, Brockett Horn, where we love to teach our students uh, in person and, and live. But this year we've been teaching online and actually MICA has been experimenting with online teaching for several years and developing content that we can share with people all over the world. So today's talk, some of the ideas can also be found in, in more depth and, and more varieties and more topics in a class that Brockett and I offer online at Cadenze called Graphic Design History and Methods. So you can join us there as well if you are interested. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, storytelling, which is my favorite subject. And I love this because as graphic designers, we really want to engage people. We want to engage their emotions. We want to engage their sense of empathy. We want to create a feeling of action and agency for the people looking at our work or using our work. Um, and storytelling is a perfect medium for doing those things. Um, it's our most ancient universal form of expression. Um, and what I'm gonna do tonight is take you through some of the principles that are universal to stories, but ground them in design practice. And we're gonna look at a lot of things together. I'm gonna ask you to look at some things and comment in the chat if you like. Um, we'll do that um, soon. So uh, the first principle I want to share with you is the idea of point of view. So every story has a point of view character. And we're familiar with this from movies and novels that we experience the world through the point of view of our hero. And in graphic design, designers have developed various ways to kind of bring us inside the psychological experience of a character. One of my favorite mediums for looking at, at that are film posters and theater posters because they have to represent the psychological conflict of um, a story through a single image. So this beautiful Polish film poster uses a very simple collage technique uh, to suggest the interior life of this individual. Um, and we, we can really feel a sense of entering into his mind 
uh, experiencing him in relation to a landscape and a city and a time and a place. Um, and these are techniques that designers can, can use. So this is a poster that uses a very simple montage technique um, to take us inside the mind of a, of a person. Um, and that's something that you as designers uh, can try in your work. Um, now you see a poster called Tartuffe, a black and yellow poster. And at the center of the, of the image is a very tall man with a TV for a head. Um, and he's surrounded by a crowd and these smaller people are looking up at him. And really we're in their point of view. We are looking at this, uh, this figure, this uh, TV evangelist uh, figure who's commanding our attention. And we're essentially have joined the crowd. We have the point of view of the crowd. Um, and so th this idea of, of manipulating uh, perception and psychology and showing who is a hero in an image um, and who is a spectator, who is a witness. Um, I want to take a moment to ask you all to look at this poster, um, an incredible film poster from Switzerland, um, and it shows a scene, um, um, a, a, a dinner scene, <laughs> hopefully not from, from your house, um, and the father is the point of view character, right? He is the, the main figure um, in the scene. And I, I want you to just take a look at the poster and type a few words in the chat. What connects us emotionally with the father? What has the designer done to ensure that we are empathetic with him? We are concerned about his position. <laughs> we identify with him. And we don't identify with anybody else, right? We're cut off from them emotionally. So I see he's the only face that we see, right? And so if the designer had simply used the photograph as it existed, um, we might feel more connected to the other characters. And so blocking their faces helps to intensify our connection with the father. Um, and also creates incredible visual play and fun. Um, so we get this graphic excitement that also has a psychological emotional function. Um, and that's really key to us in graphic design is how can we create an image that is exciting and fresh and has um, visual components. I see breaking the fourth wall. Uh, escaping, right? He wants to escape, but he can't because he's wearing a leash, which is very alarming. And he's looking to us for help, right? He's, um, he's reaching out to us emotionally. This is a very famous poster on the screen now by Milton Glaser, his Dylan poster of 1968 in our collection at Cooper Hewitt. All these posters are from our collection. Um, and, and in this very famous poster, Milton Glaser brings us inside the mind of Bob Dylan. Um, and by turning his hair into this rainbow of color, he um, suggests the music, the imagination, the thoughts of the singer, right? And if we pull back, we see his face is dark. His face has... Um, really no emotion, no features, we're brought inside, right? We're brought into his interior experience. Um, and here's an example from more contemporary design. This is a, a beautiful uh, brand illustration for medium. Um, and by trying to convey the experience of this young woman reading an article on medium, the artist has used simple collage and opened up her head and growing from her head is life, right? The life of ideas. Um, and throughout the, the branding of the site, the, the designers create these kind of images that attempt to convey to us the experience of reading 
um, and how op how opening that is, right? That to read something is really to open your mind. And then there are moments of reward, right? That, that are not so much about reading, but are about becoming a member, right? <laughs> and, and rewarding us for that achievement, right? For, um, for joining the team, being part of the team. Um, and so we can see some, you know, repetition of techniques, right? And as designers, uh, we all collect things to look at. We all seek inspiration in history and in film and contemporary life. Um, and so I like to see how some of these concepts recur. Um, another really important idea about stories is the idea of a path uh, that every story takes us somewhere. Um, it has duration, it has beginning, middle, and end. Okay, and now we see two pictures. <laughs> okay, two pictures of a forest in spring. And if you could just put a note in the, in the path, in the chat, sorry. <laughs> um, Okay, I see a lot of people saying, saying B, and I agree with you, <laughs> and I'd love to know why. Yes, we seem to go somewhere, right? And th these are images with a path, and if you go to the next one, yes, great. So just putting an image of a road starts to invite action, it suggests motion and time, and a point of view, right? Suddenly, we are a person standing on that path. So point of view in the sense of, what am I looking at? Next slide. Um, and if you Google big picture of forest, which I did, <laughs> uh, you will find that many of these images, these are the most popular images, have some kind of path or stream or a dominant tree or two dominant trees having a conversation together, that these are the kinds of images that people find more narrative. They find them um, more inviting um, because they have the, the most basic indication of, of a story, of a narrative. You go to the next slide. This is another poster from our amazing collection at Cooper Hewitt. It's by E. McKnight Coffer, who was a designer in the early 20th century. And he's created a path in this travel poster to invite us to travel. Next. And if we come in close, we are rewarded by baby mushrooms and light and shadow. It's a journey, right? The poster takes us on a journey. Next. Um, this is a, a later poster by the same um, artist when he's discovered futurism. And this poster is more abstract, it's more modern. Um, and yet it has the same technique. It has a path that carries us into the future. And the future is a motorcycle. <laughs> Next slide. I love this detail, right? Which gives us this climax of the story, right? The story is, is a line that takes us to this event. Next. So every story has duration. And if we think about the poster, right? A poster is a flat image. And yet the way we absorb it, just like any book cover or website or page of text, our eye has to travel across the piece. Um, and as designers, we can kind of control or guide a visitor, a viewer, in, um, in taking that journey and taking a journey that we help design for them. Next. So this is an illustration by one of my favorite visual artists, Christoph Niemann. And we're looking at the top of the image. And when you come to the bottom, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> we have a story, right? So at the top of the image, we see someone hanging laundry, very boring, right? But at the bottom, we have the punchline, we have the event. Um, and even though we look at this image very quickly, it still takes time. It takes maybe a second 
for this story to unfold. So I'm going to show you another image by Christoph Niemann, and we're just going to look at the top. So just show the next slide and leave it there. Okay, so here are two hands knitting. And I want you to just take a moment and guess, what are the hands knitting? Ah, and I see some people have guessed it correctly. Go to the next slide. It's the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> I'm very impressed. Um, I would have thought a pair of socks right? Because I'm just thinking in the ordinary world. But what this visual storytelling does is it brings us a surprising world. It brings us a climax to the story. Uh, yes, very French. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead, you go to the next slide. Um, this is uh, a beautiful mural in Paris posted during the spring of 2020. Um, Better days are coming soon. And this mural is a path. Here's a path that we literally experience over time. We have to walk through it to get the message. Next. This is a, a beautiful project um, also from the spring of 2020. Uh, a, a, a graphic created in the town of Vicchio in Northern Italy for social distancing. Um, and the architects who created this painted these white squares um, in the town center to help people gather together in public and yet keep distance from each other. Next. And they posted throughout the village these beautiful graphics explaining what the purpose was of this new signage that they had created. And what you'll see from that grid is that the squares aren't all the same size. Um, and so they have uh, created this variation that's very spatial and that really references the, the history of perspective in Northern Italy where uh, linear perspective painting was invented. Next. And we can get that beautiful sense of space, that sense of point of view, that sense of perspective in this gorgeous piece, which was beloved by the town and really helped people um, during this crisis to experience public space in a safe way. Next. And all over the world, people have been creating um, beautiful or just functional <laughs> graphics for social distancing. This is Paula Scher's design for the Highline Park in New York City, where she put these beautiful green dots um, on, on the walkways of the park, but also on the furniture um, to create a really playful and joyful reminder for people to keep their distance. Next. Um, and here's where you had to wait in line to visit the park. <laughs> so in order to control the number of people at the High Line, they created a ticket system. Um, and even that has its beautiful green dots uh, to keep people organized and patient while they wait to visit the park. Next. Um, another really important thing about stories is action. Uh, stories are not passive. Uh, stories are, have events and conflict and things taking place. Next. Um, so this is another beautiful poster uh, by Joseph Muller Brockman from the Cooper Hewitt Collection. And it's a poster about traffic accidents and about warning you to watch out for children on the street. Um, and the designer by greatly amplifying the scale difference between the vehicle and the child gives us a much greater sense of action than we would have if the photographs were simply allowed to be at actual scale. So that's a, you know, a basic technique for graphic designers to enhance that sense of, of urgency and something happening. The angle is very important too. Next. 
So here's a poster by E. McKnight Coffer about tea and how tea wakes us up and makes us feel good in the afternoon. And he's put the poster, the type on an angle. And that angle really helps to create that sense of activation that we get from tea. So I had fun. I kind of redid the poster without the angle. And if you go to the next slide, you can see it. And it's very boring, right? And if you flip back um, between them, it's kind of amusing. Yes, yeah, she kind of winks, right? <laughs> My simple animation. And of course, the poster is much better the way the designer made it with the angle. Um, and that's really a, a universal technique for suggesting action and movement um, because things could be slipping and sliding and in play. Next. Go ahead, next slide. Um, sometimes designers convey action quite literally through a series of images as in this wonderful Vignelli poster um, where we, we see the dancer moving and we, we, we see him moving towards the climax of the action, right? The height of the drama is where the dancer is highest in the air and perhaps Vignelli pushed him a little higher than he actually was, right? To increase that sense of action. Next. Um, and also in, in advertising and in editorial design, we can create a, a series like in a comic book. I love this one for um, Casper Mattress and it's illustrating the idea of breakfast in bed, something we may all wish we could do more often. Uh, but here the storyline is that it's literally the coffee and the bagel getting into bed together to enjoy breakfast. Next. Um, and of course for designers, sometimes we're telling stories about products. We're telling stories about user experience that may not be the end result of our work but rather um, uh, the process of describing what people need, right? What users might experience. So this is a beautiful storyboard by the designer Mengyan Li. And she's describing the, um, the experience of a commuter with a bike who wants to get on a bus, but the bus has no room for their bike and, and the commuter ends the experience very sad, right? And so this presents a design challenge. It presents um, us with a, an emotional experience, right? The disappointment of this commuter um, and identifies a challenge that uh, designers of transportation then might try to address. Next. So storyboarding is a really valuable tool for us. Uh, it's also something that we see a lot in website design now where um, an action or a process is broken down into one, two, three parts, beginning, middle, end, as a way to invite people to say, uh, try out a service, um, become a member, sign up, um, experience something, understand what the service is. And by simplifying a much longer process into three steps, um, it helps people to really grasp the simplicity of the action and illustrate it through these, um, these three phases. Next. And so we see this number three a lot um, in stories, in, in, in design, and in instructions, um, because people have um, a great ease in grasping the idea of three. Uh, so in this poster about social distancing, the designer has chosen three kind of archetypal uh, characters who might be at risk for COVID-19. And we're able to kind of understand their humanity and understand them as a range of people. And yet that number is manageable. Um, so, so writers call this the rule of threes. It's very valuable for us as designers as well. Next slide. Um, writers and filmmakers talk about um, the narrative arc. So when you're planning uh, a story, a work of fiction, film, an episode of a TV show, uh, the idea of an arc 
that begins at a low point of energy uh, that sets a problem uh, that creates a scenario. And then as the story builds, the energy gets higher and higher. We can think of it like a roller coaster. When you get on a roller coaster at the beginning, you're low and you're literally building energy, physical energy as the car moves up the, the, the side of the roller coaster. And at the top is the point of maximum tension, maximum energy, and then whoosh, you come down the other side and that's the sense of completion. And so a really satisfying story has that whole arc of energy, including that sense at the end of having completed something. One, two, three, I'm done, I'm in, I've achieved it. Uh, next slide. And designers um, use tools like the narrative arc um, and user experience design in planning what is the experience of a user um, in encountering a product or a service? And often we, we chart that in terms of negative and positive experiences. So where will a user encounter a dip in the action, right? Friction, a problem, having to wait, uh, not being able to find what they need, a point of confusion. Um, and this is a very valuable tool for designers and it is a storytelling tool where we imagine this rising and falling emotional experience of a user. Next. So every story is an emotional journey. We go to a place, things happen, but we feel things when they happen. Next. Um, this is a beautiful diagram by an exhibition designer, uh, Ben Jett, and he uses this diagram to show intensity. So that in an exhibition, which is a physical journey, right, through a place, um, there are points of emotional intensity. And a designer plans for like, what will be the long view? Um, where will a visitor be expected to have the greatest reaction? And where do we need them to rest? Where do, where do people need a break, right? A white space, a gap, a bench, right? These are very important for the experience of our users. Um, next slide. So this is the same designer applying this principle to the design of an exhibition about the American Civil War, which is an extremely emotional topic in our country. And as you can see, this exhibition has a lot of hot spots, right? a lot of areas where, where people are gonna be um, overwhelmed and, and confronted with very intense information. So it's important then to build in those gaps. So you can go to the next one. Um, so Ikea is another emotional journey. Um, I imagine many of you have been to Ikea <laughs> and have journeyed there. And when I, when I first went to Ikea, I thought this is like a maze, right? Um, but then I started doing research and I discovered that Ikea is not really a maze. Next. It's a labyrinth. Okay. So a maze is, is a puzzle designed to make you lost. And a labyrinth uh, is actually a fixed path where my, my motion is controlled through the space. And so if you think about designing a book or a website or an exhibition, sometimes we allow our users complete freedom, but they might get lost. And sometimes we have a very fixed path, but like a movie is a fixed path. You can only go forward, <laughs> right? But a book, I can flip around in the book and, and get lost if I want. So let's take a little trip through Ikea next. Um, <laughs> so we leave the parking lot and we, we enter the world of o Ikea and we're like a hero, right? We're on the hero's journey. We enter this magical branded space where everything is designed, right? And it is a fixed path, right? We are told which way to go next. Um, 
And eventually we go downstairs where we are confronted with lots more stuff uh, next. And inside the store, there is literally a path, right? It has different paving on it. It has an edge around it. It has light projected arrows reminding us to keep going on the path. Next. Um, and the path goes on and there are scenes and events like almost theatrical plays, right? Where we encounter this perfect kitchen, for example. Next. There are secret passages for escaping the path, if you know how. <laughs> Next. Um, and then finally, we gather all our materials. We, um, we pay the money. Uh, we put everything in the shopping bags that we have had to bring with us. Next. <laughs> and at the end, there is a hot dog, at least at my Ikea. It may be a different food in Singapore. <laughs> But this hot dog is so cheap, they're paying me to eat it. And this hot dog is to save my life, right? Because I am, I'm so glad that you have these wonderful hot dogs. I think the veggie hot dog is quite, quite good. <laughs> and I am so grateful for this hot dog because at this point I am exhausted. <laughs> and if I didn't have that hot dog, I would die like Jack Nicholson in the maze at the end of The Shining, right? This is savior and it is an emotional gift to me from Ikea. Next. So let's apply this to a famous fairy tale, the story of Cinderella and imagine Cinderella as a customer experience. Next. So at the beginning of the story, um, her emotional state is very low. She has nothing to wear. She can't go to the ball. She has a miserable life. So what does she do? She downloads the Fairy Godmother app. Next. Next. And this is fantastic. Great product. Love it. Next. And Cinderella is giving this product, you know, lots of stars, lots of thumbs up. She loves the dress. She loves the carriage. She loves the party. There's just one problem. Next. Ah, curfew. Something bad's going to happen at midnight. Next. So Cinderella's at the party and she's having a great time. And it's almost midnight. And she knows she's got to get back to that carriage or it's going to turn into a pumpkin. And she's running down the steps and she loses one of these stupid glass slippers on her way, but she almost makes it next. And it's 1159 and we know what happens at midnight next. At least where I am, the most popular times to travel. You have to pay more. We call it surge pricing. And this is terrible. Cinderella hates it. Next. And now she's pissed, right? No more loving of Fairy Godmother app. <laughs> So the designers back at fairygodmother.com, they're like, what are we going to do to bring Cinderella's emotions back up? And they come up with this great thing, which is a lost and found service. So they, they find out Cinderella's address, they violate her privacy, they come to her house, they bring her that slipper. And we all know how the story ends. It's very satisfying. It gives us a beautiful sense of completion. Next. She gets her shoe back and opens her own shoe store and is financially independent ever after. <laughs> I wish it ended like that. So emotion, sometimes the emotions that we have to convey aren't happy ones, right? So we're in a very tough time now. There's a lot going on. Um, in my country, this uh, pandemic is still very tough. It's getting better, but it's very tough. And so this is a graphic created by our Centers for Disease Control um, about COVID symptoms. And it really tries to remove the emotions, right? So like not giving the people any facial expression or any face, <laughs> right, is a way to literally erase emotions from this poster. 
Maybe that's a good idea. I don't know. Next. This is um, the same content presented by the amazing designer Mona Chalabi. And she's decided to go for the emotions and to communicate to people about the reality of suffering and to do it in a way that is playful and warm and humane, but doesn't um, eliminate that sense of emotional urgency. Next. Um, finally, I, I wanna talk about our senses and this is my last little chapter. So we've talked about the path, we've talked about agency, action, We've talked about point of view, which is very important. Whose point of view is a story told from? And finally, there's our senses. So really good stories uh, engage our senses. We feel like we've gone someplace. Uh, we feel that we, we're being touched, right, physically. We feel that we feel the warmth of a story. We feel the coldness of a story. These are emotions that writers create with words, uh, that filmmakers create with, with movement, right? Sudden movement with music, right? Which, which elevates our sense of emotion through a, a purely audio um, soundtrack. And as visual designers, we can play with people's senses too. Next. Um, so here's another, <laughs> another little project for you to do uh, very quickly is here are some shampoo, shampoo and conditioner bottles uh, from my bathroom. And I want you to pick A or B, which one do you think is better designed? I see a lot of A's, I see some B's. I say it's pretty equal, um, but somebody said B because I would get them confused. And that's exactly what, how I feel about this, because as you might notice, I wear glasses <laughs> and I don't wear them in the shower. <laughs> and when I see these two bottles, A, they look exactly the same. Uh, it's just that little bit of typography that's different. Whereas B, the entire shape of the bottle is different. And even with my glasses off, I can figure out which one is which. Now imagine if you were blind in the shower, you would really need to have that tactile signal to know which product to use. Yeah, so next. Here's another one. Which one do you think was designed to appeal to women? <laughs> a or B? <laughs> I see a lot of people doing B. I think you're absolutely right. Um, you go to the next slide. Um, they actually have the same amount of beer in them, uh, but by making the B, the second one, thinner, it feels um, smaller in your hand, uh, and many women have smaller hands, not all, um, and it, it looks thinner, right, so it appeals to our sense of drinking a light product that has fewer calories, and then my favorite part of all is that the whole surface is reflective, right? So whereas the, the A has dark green all over it, um, by having this kind of naked aluminum on the second product, it's light in the sense of light, right? Light reflecting. So it's a very subtle effect, but I really think it affects our experience of the product. Um, and, and what I find so remarkable is the mix of visual and tactile cues, right? How does it feel in my hand? How do I think it will feel, right? How much will it weigh? What is its lightness physically? And then the idea of light reflecting. Someone's pointed out it's like a silver jewel. <laughs> it really is elegant and it's just a can of beer. Next. And of course we use uh, color to convey a sense of, um, of taste and smell. So this is a beautiful line of tea packages and the tea inside the package all looks pretty much the same, right? It's very similar. But by giving each box its own distinct color, the designer begins to create this uh, signal for us about the relative uh, lightness or richness 
or floral aspect of each flavor of tea. Next. And we can do this with products that aren't intended to be eaten at all. This is a line of Polaroid cameras called the ice cream pastels edition. <laughs> and so by using these colors that have a sensory memory for us, the designers have, uh, have made this a desirable and fun and playful kind of summertime experience. Next. This is a beautiful project by one of my students at MICA. It's a game about digestion. <laughs> So this lovely river that you see is actually the river inside your intestines. And in her game, um, she has, you know, healthy food and the, the intestines are in a healthy state and everybody's happy. And it looks quite sunny inside your gut. But when things go wrong, next the whole mood changes. <laughs> and so this simple shift in color palette creates an entire emotional transformation in your experience of the game. Next. And this is a COVID-19 map um, from Johns Hopkins University where that color red is used to convey urgency and the seriousness of this problem. Next. Whereas this map, um, it's a map of Chicago uh, showing that high prevalence of healthcare workers in a particular neighborhood in Chicago. And here the designer didn't want to use red uh, because they didn't want to convey um, a negativity to this data. And so color, they deliberately chose the color purple because it doesn't have that emotional connection, that emotional uh, weight to it. Next. I think we're almost done. Um, I picked this out because it has a nice connection to Singapore. This is a project by Kate McLean who does smell tours of different cities. And she takes people through the city um, experiencing what different areas smell like. And so she's created this wheel to represent the different flavors. Um, and what I want you to notice is that she doesn't she doesn't want to make any of them negative. So you'll see there's beautiful things like flowers and trees, but there's also garbage and animal manure. And she uses color to suggest that these are simply experiences for people to take note of in their sensory tour of a city. Um, and we'll go to the next slide, which is a beautiful map of Singapore. Um, at where she took people through, through the city and found areas that had these different densities of smells. And it becomes a different way to think about space um, and using color as a way to trigger our memory of those experiences is really cool. And uh, go to the next. Um, so now let's look at storytelling in action. We're gonna look at how one designer applied storytelling across an entire project. Next. So Eden Liu is a graphic designer who was asked to create a logo for an organization called The Last Mile. Next slide. And this organization is a volunteer group that delivers masks and protective equipment to healthcare workers. And so Eden designed this beautiful logo and the logo is a path. It shows a road and the road has an intersection and together they make a cross, which is a symbol for healthcare. Uh, so the client loved it and it was very clear and helped them to announce their service and use it as stickers and website and all kinds of things that they needed a logo for. for, for. But then Eden wondered, what else does the organization need? Next. So she saw that they had these very complex diagrams explaining the process of collecting and delivering protective equipment. Um, and these are clearly designed with a kind of engineering point of view and they show all the steps and all the complexity 
of the core function of the organization. But Eden thought, hmm, I could design this to tell a much simpler story. Next. And so she made this graphic, which is more for the volunteers to understand exactly what the organization does. It's not the back end, it's the front end, it's the interface, it's the simple how to, to encourage people to get involved with this organization. Next. And in order to create that timeline, she created a whole family of icons working with um, illustrators. And if we look at these icons, they are like illustrations in a story. They show the people being served. They show the emergency workers. They show people doing things like riding a bike. Uh, there's a path, right? A representation of a road with drop-off points along the road. And they're very simple, very direct. We talked about simplicity today in the talk. So that simplicity makes these icons very effective and very clear. Next. But Eden also created these illustrations, which are much more active and much more emotional. Um, they bring us into a scene. We have a sense of air moving and atmosphere, and we have a sense of the people, the volunteers and the emergency workers uh, doing their very heroic work that they do. And so all those levels of storytelling are brought together in this piece from the logo that tells a story, to the icons, to the process chart, uh, to these much more experiential illustrations. Next. And so just to conclude, these are some of the principles that we talked about today. And these are principles that are universal to storytelling, whether you're creating graphic design or directing a movie, or writing a novel, right? Stories have a point of view. A story is a path. A story has action. A story engages us emotionally. This is really important. We feel emotionally connected and stories engage our senses. And so those are some, some principles that you can take and apply to your design work, whether you're creating a poster, a book cover, a service, an app. Storytelling is a set of tools that you can use. So thank you so much for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you. It was great to see how, how much laughter you brought to your presentation. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to go to a first question, which is about humor. Do you think that designing mm -hmm. with a sense of humor is one of the winning factors in making a product or a design stand out among its competitors? I do. I'm a huge fan of humor. I think humor uh, makes people feel, feel good. Um, it also really helps to convey the personality of a brand that as soon as a brand um, or a product or a service, whatever it might be, starts being uh, funny, it actually undercuts itself a little bit and becomes more approachable. It immediately becomes a conversation with people. It's the type of engagement, right? When you laugh, you are literally engaging. Um, and so I think it's a very powerful tool. And it's something that designers can really study. There's a lot of principles of humor <laughs> uh, and many books about it. And you can really uh, learn to math, you know, learn some of the techniques, some of the patterns. It's basically patterns. Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. Yeah, it would be fun to purposefully apply that throughout your, your career. Okay, well, here's a, a bit of a more serious one. This one's about ethics, which mm -hmm. is a great thing to talk about. What's your view on what happens in the contemporary world where manipulation is so present, not only of information, but also of images? Even false images tell stories, engage, attract with a place and a time and have a point of view. Do you see this occurring on a re recurring basis, both from the point of view of the designer who uses storytelling as a tool, as well as the viewer who's persuaded by these devices? And in that case, is the design successful when using storytelling? Uh, <laughs> 
That's a really great uh, question. And I think um, we have to ask that ethical question about any kind of messages that, that we convey. Um, when we're dealing with data graphics, you know, that's a particularly sensitive area because people expect truth there, right? That's not mm. funny. Especially at <laughs> right? times like these. Truthful. Yes, and so that's why, you know, I was showing the examples with using color, for, for example, to um, amplify an emotional reaction. And in fact, some people have objected to that COVID-19 map by JHU for being alarmist, you know, but using that color red to show how bad things are. And if you look at, you know, other maps of COVID-19, some of them are very pale and light and gentle um, and have been designed to make people feel less um, alarmed. And so right there is an ethical question. Like is downplaying the data also manipulative? <laughs> Mm. You know, so it's a great question. Um, and, and I think it's something that we have to confront pretty much with every message, right? Are you telling the truth? Mm. Are you telling the truth about the service? Can you really sign up in three steps? Or is it really 20 steps bundled <laughs> into three? You know, and at what point is making it easier for a user is good? But at a certain point, are you are you telling a lie and that's bad? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, here's one about um, the, the nature of audience. So design mm -hmm. can be subjective. It can be interpreted and perceived differently by different people. So how can we then get our story across accurately to different audiences? Um, well, that's a really great question. I mean, some, some communication is meant to be for a very particular audience, right? So today I did a talk where I assumed that we all knew what graphic design was, right? <laughs> that I kind of came in with this base knowledge, which if I were doing this talk for uh, doctors, who I I'll also have a book about design for doctors, I wouldn't assume that they know anything about graphic design. Um, so sometimes it's knowing the specific needs of your audience. If you're trying to reach everyone, it's really important to be redundant because what do you some mean people, by that? so some people can't read. So you need to have a picture and a word. Um, maybe you have the words in multiple languages, right? You live in a multilingual culture. Um, uh, sometimes you need to have things be in audio and visual. So this is a principle of uh, inclusive design and accessibility, that if I'm watching Netflix, I, I can turn on the captions and then I can watch it with no sound. And that's helpful to me, but it's essential to a person who can't hear. I can also turn on an audio track that describes what's going on and people aren't as familiar with that, but that helps someone who's blind. So this redundancy is important for including everybody if you're trying to do that, right? Okay, well, let me ask something kind of similar, but in a different way. Um, do you think different eras of time can be associated with different emotions on a collective level, despite the differences that there might be between social and cultural groups? And do, you, do we see that emerging in the design being produced at that time? Well, we certainly look back at certain times with nostalgia, right? I think we generally look at history through a very emotional lens and certain periods we might associate with terrible privation and others with like the good old days and the way, it, you know, when it was better, right? That's a big problem in my country <laughs> is people imagining this, this better time that actually was only better for some people. Right? Um, does an entire era have an emotion? I don't think so because I think I think that excludes a lot of people. So we imagine an era as being only the people in power, or the people who are in movies or the people that novels were written about, but actually there's you know millions of people who aren't in those stories. 
Mm. Okay. Um, there's been a few questions along these lines. When designing, what's the best way to decide whether we should keep things simple? Sometimes a designer will get feedback that things are too direct or things are too difficult. What's the, the best way to keep things simple? I mean, I generally want things to be simple, and yet I write books where you know every inch has content on it because you know, I don't want to waste any moments of like sharing my my love with my reader. Um, you know, as a writer, I spend a lot of time simplifying sentences. I think generally people really, you know, want things to be easier, not harder. <laughs> and as artists, we sometimes go in the other direction because the things that are intricate and complex and layered are, are beautiful and, and fun to make and engaging uh, to some audiences. Mm -hmm. But I, I think generally in life, we don't want to work too hard. So ma making things simple and clear, I think there's a real, a real plus for our users. Mm. Okay, I've got one for you about your curatorial work here. What are some of the considerations you apply to designing an exhibition for an emotional journey? And how do you think about the balance between emotional and learning experiences? Um, that's a beautiful question. Um, most people who go to a museum really don't want to learn anything. <laughs> right? It's their day off. It's, it's if it's kids experience. on a field trip, they really, it's like their day out of school. Um, so, so you have to privilege the experience first and then the learning is wrapped around it. Uh, so the idea of joy and pleasure and a place to sit and a place to get coffee <laughs> is really important. And the, the knowledge and the scholarship is important too, but you, you have to create that experience of pleasure. Hmm. Okay, well, somebody asked about um, how, how to apply storytelling to a visual identity. That's one of the most succinct forms of communication. Um, that's a really great question. And my, my last example was going to show that. But, <laughs> um, yeah, so visual identity is, is great for storytelling. So there's the, the logo, which is typically a word, right? Logotype means word. Um, but we try to convey that word in a way that suggests some emotion, right? That the personality comes through. And then there's all the, you know, the brand is not just the logo, it's that supporting language. And is that language warm or is it authoritative? Is it funny? Is it, is it very serious? Um, and then of course, you know, color, which creates a sensory connection, um, uh, pattern languages, which create sensory and narrative elements. Uh, so, so branding is, is very much about storytelling. And then we build in, you know, many brands now want a kind of origin story about how the brand came to be, you know, especially with startups, um, but also like really venerable older co companies too, want to kind of convey that sense of their own um, origin. Uh, and that, that's part of uh, branding for sure. Mm. Are you okay to answer a few more? We've got a lot yeah, of people sure. asking questions. Okay, yeah, thank sure. you. Uh, we have a graduate um, graphic designer asking, about what to expect when entering the industry and staying driven and passionate. From your point of view on um, engagement, I guess, through your work, what would you say to that person? Um, you know, you have to be engaged in your work, but also in your life. And so staying engaged with the field of design you know, as a conversation among peers all around the world is really important. I think coming to events like this is part of that, that you go to work every day and you work for your clients or you work for your colleagues. And that's really important, right? That's, that's the essence of being in the design profession, but that you also stay engaged with the world 
And um, that's what, you know, museums and exhibitions and Zoom talks and books, you know, all that stuff keeps feeding your, your, your mind. Workshops, you know, mm. great stuff to do. Thank you for your contribution <laughs> in all of those regards. <laughs> sure. Somebody's asking, what would you consider bad design or bad storytelling? Well, maybe we go to the ethical question, right? Is if, if we're lying to people, that's bad. Mm. Um, you know, the example of Ikea and the maze versus the labyrinth. I think this is really, you know, a question that everyone should ask about whatever project you're doing. Are you creating um, a fixed path or are you allowing people to wander? And there's not a right or wrong answer, but if people are allowed to wander, will they get stuck? Will they get lost like I did in Zoom this morning? <laughs> it was like terrifying, right? Not to know what was going on. Um, so if you're allowing people to wander, you have to give them the tools. And if you're putting them on a fixed path, you also have to let them escape. <laughs> Right, like what if they want to leave that should be easy to leave or go back and see something again. Mm. Um, so I think with storytelling, just really being deliberate about what kind of experience you're trying to create for people and, and what degree of freedom is there in that experience. I have somebody who's designing a board game and uh, this, that's a story. Yeah, this, um, Audience member is a student of visual communication design in Turkey, Yasar University. Thank you for your question. Um, working on redesigning a board game, what do you think is important in redesigning a game? Well, the game has to be fun. <laughs> and that's the game mechanics. And there's whole theories and books you can read about that. So if the underlying game isn't fun, it doesn't matter how cool the money looks or how cool the spinning wheel is, <laughs> any of that stuff, right? All of that is skin, it's embellishment on the game. So if you're redesigning a game, the first thing I would do is like, make sure that the game is fun. And is there anything you can do to make it more fun? Like to raise the stakes. <clears throat> to make the, the, the play faster so people aren't waiting for their turn. You know, what are people doing while they're waiting? And then do the like rebrand it and make beautiful new graphics. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, I, I think we're, we've gone over time and I don't want to keep people from their day. So I'm going to end up with just one last question. How do you know when a design is complete? How do you know when to stop? I never want to stop. <laughs> when I do my projects, whether it's a book or an exhibition, I just want to keep making it better, you know? So that's hard. Um, but your user should know that you're done, right? And this is that idea of the experience. The story is a beginning, middle, end. Mm. It has a sense of completion. Mm. As people should feel like it's finished, like it's complete. Um, when you go to a restaurant, you know, you want that sense of having completed the experience mm. and that when you, you leave, you, you've done something and you didn't spend the whole time waiting or being frustrated. Mm. Um, so make sure they know you're done, mm. <laughs> even if you're not. <laughs> That's a great message to end with, thinking about the audience and empathy for your audience. Thank you so much, Ellen. And audience, thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions. Ellen, it's been a real pleasure to host you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Narelle. We I hope really to see you in it. Singapore at the National Design Centre <laughs> sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> and to all of our audience members as well. So thank you again, and I'll take it back to Charlotte. to the end of our session and we would appreciate it if you could take some time to share your feedback through a quick survey by scanning the QR code on your left. A link to the survey can also be found in the Zoom chat. Let us know what type of future programs you'd be interested to see from the National
International Design Centre. And lastly, if you would like to find out more about the upcoming programmes the National Design Centre has lined up under the March thematic of Emotive Design, do scan the QR code that you see on the right. Thank you once again for spending time with us and we hope to see you at our future.